Welcome back, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce you all now to Joe Cooper from uh, the city of Salisbury. Joe is the manager of community capacity and learning at the city of Salisbury in South Australia. Over the 25 year career she has had in libraries, Joe has developed and delivered library services in a range of diverse multifunctional leadership roles. Jo has a particular interest in project man management, funding and policy development, and actively contributes to the South Australian Public Library Network. She is a member of the Public Libraries of South Australia Executive Committee and the Public Library Standing Committee, which is a statutory body of the Libraries Board of South Australia. We look forward to hearing uh, Joe, talk about the Salisbury Community Hub. Thank you, Joe. Hi, everybody from sunny Adelaide. It's great to be with you all online. So, as Janine mentioned, um, I'll be talking about the Salisbury Community Hub Library. To give you a bit of context, um, I've got some information there on the screen about the city of Salisbury. And as mentioned, I'm the manager of community capacity and learning, which is made up of both our library sites and our community centres with a total of 12 locations. The Salisbury Community Hub is a four storey, 7,200 square metre community hub civic building. The Salisbury Community Hub proposal was developed as part of the Salisbury City Centre Renewal Strategy way back in 2012. And this was following extensive community consultation at the time. Council then officially endorsed the project in December 2017 with the building to drive revitalisation of the city centre. The building is a modern and contemporary facility of library services, civic spaces, a gallery, council chambers, administration services, and office accommodation. It was interesting to hear Margaret Sullivan's keynote speech at the beginning around designing spaces and libraries with community. The design principles listed at the top of the slide were in conjunction with community and a range of community sessions. The design principles listed at the bottom of the slide are those that we narrowed in for on the library, the library design. So the multifunctional library space brings together learning, digital, meeting, social and community spaces to provide an improved customer service, to be blended with council civic and front of house. Future space is designed to be future-proofed and flexible to easily accommodate uses of different scales and the needs of our constantly evolving community. Vibrant place acts as a catalyst for the Salisbury City Centre and to have the library as a showpiece for the brand and awareness of our service delivery. And Community Place promotes the use of the capital expenditure to improve community facilities and services while meeting council's strategic objectives. So the official community consultation process for the design commenced in 2017, which incorporated community sessions, town hall meetings and roadshows. Um, at each stage of key milestones. I've put up here some architectural impressions just to give you a sense of where we started and where we went to. The internal floor configuration is designed as a market for community and enterprise, where floors are generally considered publicly accessible, allowing access to council staff, technology and meeting spaces amongst other council programs and initiatives. It's a place where the community can participate in unstructured opportunities to gather, learn, socialise and feel part of the community. The architect's hassle used consistency for the architecture and interior design from the external ground plane to the upper level. The foyer allows daylight to permeate building spaces, making the activities of council staff and our community apparent to each other. The building is composed with visual shifts setbacks and cantilevers of a strong horizontal plinth, which forms a human scale to the large four-storey building. 
Another interesting quirk and uniqueness about the building is it's located directly adjacent to an historical cemetery. So these are the design features of the overall building form before I move to the library itself. So photo one to the left is a community terrace of the library space. Photo two is the office accommodation with a staircase linking levels two and three. As mentioned, the meeting spaces blend with council administration and are used by both the public and the staff. So in the public areas, there are 16 spaces available for booking. Floor to ceiling windows bring the outside in providing natural light and connection to the civic square. Technology systems include Crestron, smart TVs and room booking panels, integrated Wi-Fi network for different activities, extensive AV systems and an outdoor big screen. The building exceeds minimum DDA requirements and includes extensive disability access parking, visual alarms, hearing loop system, accessible adult change facility, sit to stand study desks and a contemplation room. The community terrace of the library space provides views and outdoor seating areas and is used for all manner of activities. It's really interesting to the photo on the left, you can see the office accommodation. So we have a good view of what is happening on the terrace. That includes students socialising after school, chess, eating area, and we've even seen people vlogging from that terrace. Performance and event spaces have been cleverly designed to blend throughout the building. Furniture and equipment is mobile and there are approximately 40 event mode setup templates, which can accommodate between 20 to 500 persons. There's permeability throughout the building with viewing areas and platforms, for, which is quite good for people watching, but also for staff surveillance. A central bleacher staircase connects the ground and first level, which is the preferred space for Instagram shoots and TikToking. The Laced Cafe provides community and staff access and catering services for the building. The John Harvey Community Hall has flexibility to operate both as a meeting space and a gallery for exhibition. There are exhibition cab cabinets throughout the building for more permanent cultural or community curation. So these are the library designs and the architectural plans, which I just thought I'd briefly touch on. The size of the library itself across the two levels is 2,620 square metres. Areas on the ground floor are designated through the use of rugs and distinct furniture selected for a particular purpose. A variety of furniture styles were selected in collaboration with the architect to suit the needs of the various requirements of the customer groups. This floor is a busy space which buzzes with activity in each sectional area which blends from one to the next. Level one incorporates the council chamber event space and technology suite in addition to staff accommodation and a commercial kitchen. This area or this level is noticeably quiet and is a favoured space for students to study. Which brings me to the library design itself. The library services project team were inspired by other library buildings that we visited, including new developments in all three library sectors. At this point, I'd like to pause and thank those library services and the, the locations that we visited, um, who shared their knowledge and experience. The design is a blend of everything that we learned from others. Also, I'd like to point out that we worked extremely closely with our architect, Yan Yan Ho from Hassel Architects. So the meeting, study and relaxation spaces can be found throughout the building where customers choose their level of visual and audio noise. They can select a meeting room, sit to stand study desk, lounge or designated tech area. Photo one is an example of booths dotted throughout the building. And photo two is a visitor lounge in the foreground with a meeting room in the background Stairs to the right lead to level two, which is the staff accommodation. Photo one here is of the public PCs of which we have 20, and these are adjacent to the printing and scanning options. Photo two, you can see comfortable lounge suites. 
study desks with power and data overlooking the civic square. And you can just see there a green lounge chair, which creates a quite a bit of a nook between the kitchen shelving. The technology is blended with the power and data available on all desks, furniture and stairs. There is a self-servicing ticketing system for JP and other services, drop-down screens and audio for library programs, digital promotion and display QR codes for various services. So photo one shows embedded power and data in all of these furniture styles. So you can see a booth um, in the front of photo one and a table towards the back. And photo two shows the lounge areas and meeting spaces with technical options. Staff and customers can use the Creston system, which is um, accessed wirelessly through an app. The design has been future-proofed with ability to remove equipment as it becomes redundant to be, to be upgraded. There are face plates that are not yet wired and public PC area has two tables manufactured and designed by UCI that can be removed as bring your own device use increases. This is the children's area on the ground floor where the architect cleverly designed integrated tech solutions, including photo two, you can see story box consoles. And this sits alongside no tech options, including a Lego table and of course the library collection. One unique feature of this building is its integrated design. So library services blend seamlessly with other administrative and civic services of council. This includes council customer service, sorry, events, hub operations, inspectorate services, immunisation, home assist and the planning area. The integrated team has been trained in what we call level one and two inquiries across libraries and customer service. These two teams work together to offer a seamless customer experience. There is no designated circulation desk nor a large customer service counter. Instead, customers are still greeted in the foyer by a concierge who assists them there and then on an iPad. If they're unable to help them at, at that time, they transfer them to a specialised staff member with what we call a warm handover. On the ground floor, the technology is grouped in a central area. So we have RFID self-service, information kiosks, a visitor sign-in system, digital information screens and a queue system. Photo one is of a pod where all of our technology obviously to assist customers and we use a gatekeeper system to protect the corporate network. Photo two is of a meeting space that can double up for waiting for the conference rooms. And the third photo actually showing staff and customer service teams working together as we moved into the building. In that photo, they're training on the new integrated systems. Our marketing ap approach was influenced both by retail, but also the other libraries that we saw across Australia. This is about marketing our collections with professionally developed collateral, including pull-up banners and exhibition display. The programs and marketing team decided on a new, new approach for promotion that was at a much higher standard than we previously used. And keeping in mind too, with our five sites, we are um, pushing that out across our entire library service. There are curated collections for historical services, our top 10 or popular items and lifestyle areas. Photo one is of the picture book wall in the children's area that is visible from the busy street outside. And visual merchandising principles have been used in the selection of props for particular areas that you can see in photo two. The exhibition cabinets are attached to the ends of key collections and are rotated to highlight collection areas. Uh, the pull-up banners advertise services and digital content. The idea of that was to replace posters and leaflets. New designs were implemented for visual presentation for programs. We tried to eliminate as much paper as possible to reduce the clutter and introduce one central area for community information. So for particular library technology solutions, we looked to implement the latest of what was available at the time in around 2018 and 19, that of course matched our budget. So photo one shows smart shelves that are installed um, under the stair void on the ground floor. 
photo two is a bit of a candid one of our staff who at the time were installing the Quick Connect software on the sit to stand RFID self check at the time of our move. We also upgraded our printing services, security and network configurations for different groups of customers and events. Which brings me to our shelving, which is a blend of joinery and resource furniture slim form. The architect worked with resource furniture who were our suppliers to complement slim form units. Apart from some fixed wall areas, all shelving is flexible and can be moved within the event plan mode so that customers can continue to access collections where required. Photo one is of the slim form units on the ground floor with the fiction collection. And photo two is the custom joinery on level one that houses non-fiction along with some clever display. I pop these photos in just particularly because I like photo one um, because it shows a selection of the non-fiction collection and views through to the tree canopy. This is a favourite spot for quiet reading and for reflection. So it's, um, it's quite a busy area. Anytime we walk down there, there's always someone sitting there. We experimented with the layout of the shelving for the building at the planning stage and decided rather than grouping the shelving together, we would wrap the non-fiction collection around the western side of level one. We have many options for library programs, event and activity areas. The children's area is still um, traditionally hosting our early literacy programs. But then we worked with the architect to design areas for different program uses. And this definitely came out of the community consultation. Photo one is an open area on level one that can convert to an exhibition space. Note the hanging rounds on the far wall and the study area bench or table that also doubles up for catering with water and power. There's also access to the community terrace towards the windows. And what we do is we move the shelving and furniture out to create one open space. Photo two is a conference room that usually hosts council subcommittees and formal meetings. But on this occasion in earlier this year, it was um, March, so a couple of weeks ago, um, we hosted an author talk in that area. The community hall on the ground floor also hosts our school holiday activities and e-sports programs. Photo two here of the Ghana rooms is where the movable bookcases open up. This is designed as a come and try area where we host demonstrations for digital programs, homework help and what we call free play. The bookcases can be closed when the rooms are used for other purposes. Our technology suite, dubbed the Helen Barnes technology, is configured for multiple use with a focus on all things training, exploration, building, gaming and learning, obviously our STEM programs. We have concealed storage for equipment and furniture. The e-gaming chairs are absolutely huge, so they go in the general store, but they're very important. And we have 3D printers, coding kits, laptops and VR. Photo one demonstrates some one-on-one -on -one training but two years of the coding club. So I'll now move to our project management approach. This evolved as we worked on other projects because we were looking for a balance of good outcomes with, along with the project expectations. We started that, of course, with the community consultation and then moved to customer journey mapping. Consultants KPMG were engaged by council to work on the operational readiness aspects of the project such as planning and implementation of new systems, processes, and customer service delivery for council. But this focused more on the operational business side. As a library services team, we worked somewhat outside of that structure as we were already experienced project managers and were specialists in our field. However, we did have a seat at the table with the corporate governance and the overall project team. We put together and put in place what we called sub-projects for the library. Those sub projects are listed on the um, slide towards the bottom. An expression of interest was put out to our entire library services team to work on a sub project. These sub projects were chaired by our coordinators from the library leadership team, and it was expected that subject matter experts and technical staff were part of the appropriate team. So, in other words, the team leader for collections would sit with collections. Work breakdown structures in project were developed for each sub project 
and then rolled up into the library program with milestones and progresses reported to KPMG. Being the library professionals that we are with a slight tendency for OCD, these work breaks work breakdown structures were extremely detailed but served us well in such a complex project and with many key stakeholders and moving parts. The technology plan, for example, had 732 lines of tasks and milestones. So talking a little bit about the success of the project, we opened in November 2019 and since then we've experienced visitation of 325,682 persons, which is a monthly average of just over 20,000 people. This figure excludes private hires and corporate events. It's quite difficult to gauge what's happened since and what our success is in terms of some aspects of our library service, generally because of the pandemic um, closures and restrictions. However, prior to the pandemic hitting us all, we did design an uplift program, which was designed to activate the building for the period of January 2020 to March 2020. The rationale for the project uplift was to increase visibility and to invite the community to explore the building and to see what was on offer. This resulted in 3,573 program participants for the three month period over 165 sessions. This uplift, in addition to our usual programming, included virtual reality, digital, liter digital literacy tasters, Lego free play, Minecraft, chess tournaments, and come and explore tours, which were popular with schools and community groups. Compared to our previous location, this was, a, this was an increase of 400% in program participation in line, of course, with the 250% increase in available programs and activities. Our programs have since evolved and returned to a regular schedule. The corporate event team managed the larger events, including citizenship ceremonies, formal council meetings and celebrations like Harmony Week, which will be celebrated at the Hub tomorrow. Feedback from the community has almost been overwhelming, both voting with their feet and in response to our services. We receive lots of great compliments. Our concierge area is able to undertake pulse surveys to gauge and review services, which have all been positive and also help us improve our services. And over time, well, the last 12 months or 14 months, we have actually tweaked a few things. Salisbury Community Hub overall has also been recognised with two awards from the South Australian Architectural Awards in 2020. So the last part of my presentation focuses on the learnings for this project. This project had many key stakeholders and was quite political. Council reputation was at stake because it was the largest capital expenditure of council to date. Much more scrutiny than our usual capital projects. Therefore, we had a structured governance um, approach, including a project control group. This meant for the library leadership team that we had to up our game in terms of reporting and assigning our technical responsibilities. Project planning was key in allowing us to plan services programs and collections well in advance. And the sub projects that I talked about commenced approximately 18 months prior to our project completion. The sub project approach worked well, distributing the workload amongst our team members involved. And it also allowed staff who hadn't previously had experience in a capital project to do so. They added considerable value to the project rather than just attending a workshop here and there. The added bonus of this approach was that we could work on our um, change management plan and the team members, of which there were about 30, advocated at every level. The old Central Library building, known as the Lamberdell Library, had, had, had a long history and legacy of over 20 years. It was well loved by the community and staff. It was tired but serviceable. We decided to recognise the old, while bringing forward to the new, by holding a series of goodbye activities. For our community, that meant moving some of the artwork, which was in the old building. And for my team, I have promised to no longer mention the quilt. We also took some of the new, 
some of the room naming with us that existed in the old building. And our social media posts focused on remembering and celebrating the history leading into and preparing for the new. It was also a good way to promote new services to existing and potential new customers. For our staff team, we planned a series of themed days for clean up, project updates and celebrations at key milestones. Being library team, most of that was food related. As we prepared to move into the new facility in the final weeks, we, had a, we held a celebration. This included some presentations and photos that you can see on the screen. This was a good way to make peace with the past and move forward with our memories. The council collaboration on this project was next level. We worked with colleagues that we possibly hadn't worked with before. Our learning is that some areas of council had different perspectives on what the new building would offer to the community. And it also emphasised at times how little they understood about our services. Some of this was not actually resolved until we moved into the new building as design decisions had to be made um, prior. So the library leadership team had to advocate hard to ensure that we retained spaces and components that were critical to our operation. I'm pleased to say though, that the positive is that we're fully supported by a general manager and of course our wider colleagues. Our team is always our greatest asset. And this project highlighted their professionalism, flexibility, creativity, and their work ethic. This increased the respect for the library team and the library services staff in all manner of ways including with our contractors, KPMG, Turner Townsend, who were the project managers, and HY, the builders, who approached our staff for advice and assistance constantly. The one downside of that is it did increase our workload. This demonstrated the capability of the project management and technical skills of the staff. So in closing, I'd like to say thank you for allowing me to present today, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Janine. again my apologies everyone that I forgot to unmute we've run out of time for questions but thank you Joe for sharing your ideas on changing spaces with us today just as you've learned from others I'm sure many will learn from you well that concludes the formal part of the presentations this afternoon we will take a short break before the announcement that many have been waiting for who has won the Australian Library Design Awards. So over to our break. Thank you. <laughs>